Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, week uh, four. Uh, and uh, last week we heard from Professor Martin Lachlan about uh, the evolution of the state and the constitution in uh, the United Kingdom. And this week we're going to hear from Professor Alan Sked from the Department of International History about the development of uh, modern British government, that is to hear about some of the institutions which have now evolved within these constitutional arrangements that we heard about last week, which form the bedrock of contemporary uh, government in Britain. And in future weeks, we'll hear more about some of the individual institutions within the system as they operate today. But in the usual, frame, the usual way of doing things, we'll have a lecture for about 55 minutes, 50, 55 minutes, and then an opportunity for some questions. Um, I'm not sure that's what I'm talking about. Well, you know, well, go <laughs> uh, given the rather wide sort of remit I had, what I'm going to talk to you about uh, is to look how Britain uh, has developed since the late, uh, well, particularly in the 1920s centuries. Uh, I'll, I'll go uh, with very broad brushed strokes uh, from somewhere in the past to the present. And it's my kind of idiosyncratic view of how modern Britain has developed. Uh, so I want to talk to you about modern British history and post-war Britain in particular. Uh, I don't have time uh, to go into the records of particular governments. Uh, there's far too many of them. So instead, what I'm going to do is to make some general points uh, which you can think about, which you can agree with or disagree with, as it may be. Uh, in any case, you should read up about them and, and think about them. First of all, uh, I want to say a few things that may surprise you. Uh, the British, as you know, uh, are given to understatement. And one of the things that modern British culture is given to understate most of all is the fact that modern British history even many facets of post-war British history, uh, has in fact been hugely successful. What do I mean by this? Well, you have to understand that the British aren't just an island population who happen to speak English. They are the product of, peculiar of a peculiar national culture, which in turn is the creation of particular intellectual, environmental, social, economic, political, geographical, and institutional influences. Now, I haven't got time to go into all of these things either, but what I want to do is to concentrate on three aspects of modern Britain, three aspects, three factors which, on the whole, in my view, make modern British history different from that of most other European states. And these three factors are, first of all, and I'm looking now from uh, rather a long-term perspective up until uh, the middle of the post-war period, uh, first of all, government based on the rule of law through parliament as a protector of individual liberties. First of all, government based on the rule of law through parliament as a protector of individual liberties. Secondly, uh, political and social cohesion. And thirdly, world power. Hugely successful world power. So let me take these three things in turn. I'll look at them all in turn, then I'll go over them again in reverse order. But never mind. First of all, parliamentary government and the rule of law. Well, from the 17th century, England and later Britain was to diverge from the other European powers by increasing the power of Parliament under the Stuarts, first of all. The king's powers and agents were first resisted by the courts and by common lawyers, and then Parliament itself overthrew and executed Charles I. Then came the Glorious Revolution of 1688 with the removal of James II and the introduction of the Bill of Rights. From now on, Parliament alone, alone became capable of changing the law or of authorising taxation. Monarchs only got enough funds to keep an army for a year at a time, and so standing armies disappeared. 
and even civil uh, administration was kept very small. France and the German lands, for example, had many more civil servants uh, per head in the of population in the 19th and 20th centuries than did Britain. I'm not sure that's still the case, by the way. Meanwhile, the vote uh, was extended very gradually to more and more people, uh, and popular political parties grew up. Now, this is a very, very gradual process. It goes through the Reform Act of 1832, the Reform Act of 1867, 1887, uh, Acts of 1918, 1930, 1945, all of which mean that eventually you get one man, one vote. But it also meant that the, the British people took parliamentary voting rather for granted and took the whole process of elections rather for granted and political parties rather for granted so that in the interwar period no more than say 5% of the population would be members of a major political party and the minor political parties were the far right, the far left got practically no membership at all uh, and the British took voting not all that uh, Seriously, for example, it's often said that Churchill in 1945 was defeated by the vote of the British military. Soldiers voted supposedly against them. In fact, 40% of British troops didn't bother voting at all. So voting came very gradually and was taken for granted. It's interesting in this context, this is a kind of digression, to ask why fascism or Communism never made any impression in Britain in the interwar period or at the end of the 19th century. Well, uh, it didn't make much influence in America either, and the two countries are related in the reasons why uh, they proved immune to right-wing and left-wing political extremism. Uh, by that time, take Britain, but America, I'll, I'll look into just for a second, Britain, by the end of the 19th century, of course, had a well-established two-party system, liberals uh, and conservatives. Uh, it had an electoral system, which was... <laughs> it had an electoral system, which was first past the post, this meant, of course, that it was almost impossible for a third party of any type to actually break through. The reason why Labour broke through was uh, to do with the First World War, which was an exception, but uh, because it had established two-party system uh, and had leaders who, in terms of radical causes, could appear, people like Joseph Chamberlain, Lloyd George, Ramsay MacDonald, there was no need for anybody on the extremes outside the two political parties, even if they had been able to break the first past the post uh, electoral system, uh, it was almost impossible for them to get in. The other thing is, in Britain, again in America, there was a kind of national myth. And the national myth in Britain was that uh, constitutional monarchy, uh, where the, the monarch had no real powers, and in which Parliament ruled was the fairest possible way to conduct politics. Parliament was seen as operating fairly, two sides, the Speaker holding the, 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 the floor, uh, holding the ring, uh, and two sides democratically elected, uh, being able to face off against each other in a fair way that appealed to British rules of fairness. So the working class on the whole uh, accepted this system, uh, there was very little class uh, consciousness. Um, if you read Ross McGibbon's article on why was there no Marxism in Britain in the 20th century, uh, in the English Historical Review, a lot of it's explained there. Uh, but the, the, the parliamentary system, uh, the constitutional monarchy, the, two, the, the first past the post electoral system, barring third parties from getting anywhere, uh, the fact that the two main parties could produce radical leaders uh, when necessary, all of this meant it was extremely difficult for uh, Marxism to actually make any impression. In any case, the trade unions weren't all that interested. And on the left, among the Fabians and others, you must remember Marx, uh, 
is regarded until he's rescued by the Russian Revolution uh, as a kind of failed economist. Most of his economic theory is, was taken to be bunk. Uh, the labor theory of value in particular, no one believed any of it. Um, if you looked at his uh, idea of uh, class struggle in history, well, uh, most of history has been the history of class cooperation, so that didn't seem to work. The whole dialectic seemed to be uh, very difficult to grasp as anything realistic or necessary. Uh, and revolutions, as far as the British were concerned, unless they were done at the top, uh, as in 1688, uh, they looked at continental ones in 1848 and, else, and, and at other times, they all just seemed disastrous. So Marxism never became a threat, and because Marxism was never a threat, uh, fascism was never a threat. Uh, the national government in 1931 had a majority of 500 out of about 620 MPs. Uh, there's no way that there's going to be any threat to the established order given these con conditions. And if there's no Marxism and no threat to the established order, uh, conservatives don't need to go to the radical right to fascism uh, in order to reassure themse themselves. So. Uh, uh, there were no, there were no uh, extreme challenges to the British system during the war. Uh, let me go on to look at social cohesion. Remember, Britain has no significant linguistic minorities. There's some Welsh and Scottish uh, Gaelic that exists, but most Britons uh, speak English. There was, of course, an Irish problem, but for most of the 19th century, despite a lot of noise from Ireland, there was a great deal of Irish reform. Uh, there was home rule legislation on the board. Uh, Irish MPs cooperated with the Liberals in Parliament right up to 1918. The Scots were satisfied with their own religious and legal systems as granted to them uh, under the Act of Union of 1707, and they got a separate Secretary of State for Scotland in the Cabinet in 1885. I'll go on and talk about Scottish devolution and home rule and independence later on if there's time. There were, of course, social divisions and social unrest occasionally, but the political system managed to absorb all this peacefully. There were continuous reform movements in the 1830s and 40s, Gladstonian reforms in the latest part of the 19th century, the new liberalism before 1914, the rise of the Labour Party, and even reforms from the Tory party in the interwar period. So there was peaceful social change over time. And Britain in the 19th century saw revolution as unfortunate things that happened to continentals. The third factor which shaped British politics or British political evolution has, of course, been the legacy of successful world power uh, over three centuries. We established a world empire in North America, India, Australasia, Africa. We threw the French out from nearly every continent in the world. We did the same to the Dutch. Uh, we won nearly all the wars that we were involved in, especially the First and the Second World Wars. But before that, we'd won the wars against Louis XIV, against Philip II, against revolutionary and Napoleonic France. We won the war in the Crimea. Uh, we built up the world's greatest navy, uh, and eventually we established an independent nuclear deterrent. During the earlier part of our empire building, of course, we became the world's greatest slave trading country. But from the start of the 19th century, we then led the world in abolishing the slave trade. The end result was rather curious, and the imperial legacy is a rather strange one. The fact remains that all the world's largest democracies outside Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, even South Africa, are all former members of the British Empire. Let me now try and relate some of this to the story of Britain after 1945. Um, and I'll take the points I've raised in reverse order. Let me look at empire and world power first. Since 1945, and indeed long before, Britain dismantled her empire and turned it peacefully into commonwealth. America, of course, revolted in, 19, in 1776. But the curious fact is that in 1776, most Americans were 
uh, establishing their rights as British citizens. And also curious is the fact that about 70% of white males in the American colonies in 1776 already had the vote, something that didn't occur in Britain until after the First World War. Uh, and all the British colonies uh, by 1776 had elected legislatures. Nothing like that was available in empire anywhere else in the world. They had habeas corpus, they had trial by jury, etc. So the framework of United States freedom already existed before the American Revolution. Thereafter, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa all became more or less independent before 1914. Even India was represented separately at the peace conference at Versailles and on the League of Nations. The British, uh, in short, didn't want to force their colonial subjects to become British. And this was very uh, unlike uh, the experience of the French Empire. The French believed in la mission civilisatrice, the greatest thing that France could do for anybody in the world was to turn them into a Frenchman or a French woman. This was a policy of assimilation, which they pursued everywhere in the French Empire. British didn't care about that. Uh, after America, they sort of assumed that most colonies at one stage would get fed up and would want independence. Uh, they dealt through the local elites, Maharajas, Pashas, uh, tribal chiefs, whatever, as long as they got control of defence, foreign policy, ports, railways, that was all right. It kept what the British were looking for, an imperial uh, structure throughout the world. But they, they, they didn't want to turn the natives into Brits. Uh, and so when the African elites in turn pushed for independence, they got it very, very quickly indeed in the 1960s. The Indians, of course, got theirs in 1945. <coughs> Nor did the British people seem to care very much. If the British Empire had been accumulated, as one historian said, in a fit of absence of mind, decolonisation took place in an equal fit of absence of mind. Nobody in Britain seemed to care about it. Uh, the only parts of the world that the British population were interested in were Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, that is, places where most Brits had relatives, uh, and these have been given independence before 1914. So whereas post-war France, the only really truly other European imperial power, exhausted herself in fighting wars to hang on to Vietnam and then Algeria, the Brits for the most part were only too happy to get rid, to rid themselves of imperial colonies Malaysia had lingered on a bit. It was slightly profitable, unlike most of the others. Uh, but there was a peculiar problem there about a Chinese insurrection. But in any case, uh, it wasn't that much of an exception. Meanwhile, Britain, after 1945, continued, uh, despite her size and economic problems, to be a world power of some significance. Probably the leading world power of a second rank, after the USSR and the USA. Like the peaceful transition of empire, Britain's continued exercise of world power after 1945 continued to confound critics. They howled about Suez in 1956. Uh, it was supposed to be a huge national disaster. It illuminated British weaknesses and pretensions but the fact is that Suez had no long-term consequences whatsoever. By 1958, two years later, Britain, together with the United States, uh, was landing troops in the Middle East. And by 1963, the United States was selling us Polaris missiles off the shelf, something that no other European power was sold. Britain alone got these missiles. Britain, meanwhile, since 1945, has been the United States' main ally in NATO, saved European defence in 1955 uh, after the French scuttled the EDC, negotiated the deal at Geneva at the conference there in 1954 to allow France to extricate itself from Vietnam, uh, decolonised successfully in 
as I said, without the huge wars fought by France, there wasn't completely conflict-free, but it was nothing like the wars fought by France. Eventually reached a good deal with China on Hong Kong. It won the important Falklands War, and it began, after Polaris went out of date, to buy Trident missiles off the shelf from the United States. Again, something that no other power can do. Germany, meanwhile, until the 1960s, was an occupied state, east and west, uh, without any real armed forces of its own, while France was humiliated under the Fourth Republic because of Algeria and Vietnam, collapsed because of Algeria. Uh, then de Gaulle came in and uh, formed a Fifth Republic, but on the whole, <laughs> because of his policies, he was uh, largely ignored. Uh, these days, under Hollande, people are talking about a Sixth Republic. Uh, it reminds one of the joke about the little boy that went into the British Library at one stage and asked for a copy of the French Constitution and got the reply, I I'm terribly sorry, uh, we don't stop periodicals. <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile uh, the UK, of course, has been the main ally of the United States, uh, both in its war against Iraq and the war on terror. Uh, and because of that, for reasons right or wrong, Thatcher and Blair uh, were seen in, in their time as world leaders uh, in a way in which European leaders were not. European leaders are all very prominent, as long as you're talking about Europe. But if you're talking about anywhere else, uh, they don't seem to have any influence. Well, let me now look at the second factor, political and social cohesion. This too is operated for most of the post-war period. The period 1945 to 1970 uh, certainly saw the classic, what's called the classic post-war consensus, sometimes known as butskalism. Butler being a leading Tory, Gateskill being a leader Labour man, butskalism, there was no difference between them. In 1951, I think, a, a man wrote a book called Gentian Violet in which a candidate was elected to parliament for both Labour and the Conservative parties, and nobody knew about it, and it didn't make any difference. But this was a period of the post-war consensus. Now, that consensus was based on, first, a mixed economy, partly state-owned, partly privatised industries. Secondly, the welfare state. The third part of it was Keynesian economics, the fourth part was corporatism. But there was also, fifthly, a consensus also on foreign and defence policy, which was based on A, the special relationship with the United States, uh, and B, NATO. But it was also based on C, decolonisation of empire into commonwealth, and finally, gradual uh, support for the EEC and then uh, EU. The main lines of this post-war consensus were laid down by the post-war Labour governments, uh, which nationalised the Bank of England, nationalised coal and iron and steel, civil aviation, etc. They, they, they nationalised about 20% of the British economy. Unfortunately, it was the dud part of the British economy. All the people who owned shares in these things were delighted that the Labour government nationalised them because they were given money in compensation, which they could then invest in profit-making industries, whereas the state took over the loss-making industries, didn't make uh, any changes to how they were run, set them up under boards with a few trade union leaders with peerages on the boards, uh, and the workers were, were run by the same management in the same old way, uh, and productivity remained low, and the industries remained loss-making, which meant that nationalisation got a very bad name, and after the Labour gov governments, after the, immediately after the war, nobody ever wanted to nationalise anything else. The Labour Party also set up the National Health Service, uh, which of course is the sacred cow of British politics still today. Uh, it brought in national insurance. Uh, as an economic policy, it brought in Keynesianism, that is, managing the economy, priming the pump, deficit spending, etc., etc., all of which was used to maintain high employment and growth. Uh, 
Meanwhile, during the war, the managers and trade union leaders uh, had worked together uh, and were seen as people to consult to run the economy. And all this was accepted by the Conservatives when they came into power between 1951 and 1964 and thereafter really into the 1970s. The consensus, of course, is best seen at work uh, in the reverence uh, shown to the National Health Service by the Conservatives as well as Labour, but also by the long list of expedients used by both parties to manage the economy in the 1960s and 1970s. These were all different experiments of what is known as corporatism, using government trade unions and management together to form some kind of agreed national economic policy in order to keep wages and prices under control. And this stretch from NEDI or the NEDC, the National Economic Development Council in 1961, through to the DEA, the Department of Economic Affairs and the National Plan of 1964-5, uh, the National Board for Prices and Incomes uh, of 1964, the Pay Board of 1972, etc., etc. So Tories and Labour together thought that with workers and management they could uh, have some kind of planning for national growth through corporatism. There were also Tory Keynesian deficit spending schemes under Reginald Maudling as Chancellor in 1963 to 4 uh, and under Anthony Barber as Chancellor in 1971. Now all of these consensual economic policies were reactions to what was known as Britain's relative decline. That is the fact that by the 1960s and 70s, British economic growth was much less fast uh, than growth in France, Germany and Italy. Now, there were particular reasons why growth in these countries were faster. Nothing to do with Britain. Uh, there was the rundown of Agriculture, which started much essentially almost later in these countries. There was a freer trade brought in after the opening of the EEC. But the British argued that um, Britain was being humiliated by the greater growth there and something had to be done about it. There were two schools of thought about the causes of British relative economic decline. They all ended up with these consensual policies of corporatism, but there were two paths to reaching these policies. The left uh, saw the reason for British national relative, economic relative design, uh, decline uh, in the role of sterling as a reserve currency. Because sterling was a reserve currency for a large part of the world, the sterling bloc, this meant that the pound had to keep its value in order for people to uh, keep buying sterling. But overseas defence spending kept creating balance of payments crisis, so that the domestic economy, therefore, almost every two years, there was a balance of payments crisis almost every two years, had to be cut back either by tax rises or by expenditure cuts in order to keep this, the pound strong and foreign capitalists happy. And later on, monetary targets were seen to play a, 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 equal, a, a similar role. On the right, however, the main cause for Britain's relative decline seemed all too obvious in another factor, and this was Britain's trade unions and the power that they had. Britain's hugely powerful trade unions made it, from the point of view of the right, impossible for Britain to modernise her industry because trade unions uh, demanded overmanning, restrictive practices, secondary picketing, closed shops, all of which uh, meant that management was incredibly weak. Investment or research and development was rendered futile because uh, the workers wouldn't take on the conditions to uh, operate under uh, uh, new types of machinery. Export markets were therefore lost, therefore the pound had to be kept uh, strong by the, the same sort of cuts that the left had been complaining about. But if left and right had different explanations for Britain's relative <coughs> decline, 
More and more, it was the latter explanation, they're all the trade unions, that won support. Uh, it was seen that defence cuts in 1968 made no real difference to the problem. And then things get out of hand when the miners' union in 1972 and 1974 led political strikes to bring down the government. Uh, the trade unions then prevented Harold Wilson in 1969 and Edward Heath uh, in 1970 to 74 uh, from bringing the trade union, unions within the law. I mean, meanwhile, the car industry, shipbuilding, and other industries were convulsed in mass strikes. When Labour in 1976 was forced to go cap in hand uh, for economic aid to the IMF, uh, this looked like a disaster. And in 1979, Britain under Jim Callaghan then suffered what was called the winter of discontent. Mass strikes by all sorts of trade unions who were simply ignoring the Labour government. Um, you know, you, you, you couldn't bury your dead. I mean, there were hospital strikes and people died. Uh, because of uh, strikes in the hospitals. Uh, you couldn't bury your dead because the Grave uh, Diggers Union was also in strike. Uh, rubbish was piling up in the streets. Uh, the result was, in 1979, Mrs Thatcher was voted into office to deal largely with the trade unions. And under Thatcher, between uh, 1979 and 1990, there seemed to many people to be a kind of political revolution in Britain. But in fact, what actually happened was the growth of a new consensus. Thatcher now, A, replaced Keynesianism with monetarism, B, privatised most of the nationalised indus industries, returning many to profit-making status, Thirdly, she tamed the trade unions by spectacularly defeating a year-long miners' strike in 1984 to 95 and passing trade union reform legislation. Fourthly, she abandoned all notions of corporatism. There's no more tea and sandwiches at number 10 for trade union and uh, management leaders. But, but, and this is important, she kept the NHS... She only tried a little bit of reform the very, very last period of her rule, but she kept the NHS as a sacred cow, putting more and more money in it, uh, and even more money was put into the welfare state. Welfare under Thatcher received more money than at any other time in history. And all of this was continued by John Major and Tony Blair, proof indeed that a new consensus had been established. But what did go, which things that weren't part of that new consensus, were the most radical uh, parts of Thatcherism. First of all, the poll tax uh, disappeared. Uh, and the other thing that disappeared temporarily uh, was her opposition to the EEC or EU. So under Blair and Brown, the Thatcher consensus remained. And that consensus now includes devolution, even devolution max, uh, to Scotland after the weird experience of the uh, independence referendum, which I witnessed uh, with great alarm in the Scottish Highlands, where I live most of the time these days. And, of course, it also includes the, the peace agreements in Northern Ireland. One point to note about Thatcher. Her reforms actually worked. Britain's decline, a relative decline, ended... And the British economy since about 1999 uh, has been growing at roughly twice the rate uh, of the Eurozone. Now, the last of the three factors about Britain's peculiar historical identity that I mentioned was government based on the rule of law through Parliament to uphold individual uh, institutions. Well, obviously, this has been undermined entirely over the last uh, few decades. Largely, uh, I could talk about Scottish devolution. That came about through the, uh, the Labour Party being entirely scared of the SNP and giving uh, a, dev a devolved uh, parliament to Scotland under an electoral system that was supposed to be rigged to keep the SNP out of power forever. 
like most Labour uh, initiatives, it didn't work. Uh, 2011 saw the SNP get a massive landslide majority. And then we had our present, uh, I think rather dim-witted Prime Minister, uh, arrange for a referendum on terms that were dictated by the SNP. And eventually, after he'd forgotten about it for two years, he woke up one day to discover that the United Kingdom might not be united any longer, panicked, ran up to Scotland, uh, said how much he loved it, promised devolution max, uh, and the whole thing was saved uh, in the final vote by 55.3% um, to 44.7%. Uh, but since then, because of all the squabbling, at the panicking at the end, uh, the, the SNP are now in full cry in Scotland, may destroy the Labour Party there. The Tory party is already destroyed in Scotland, as you probably know. It doesn't really exist. Uh, and the Labour Party may follow it, uh, which may reduce Ed Miliband's chances of winning an election to zilch. Uh, but in any case, um, I, the, the fact that in Scotland uh, it's going to be the case that you know, a very, very large chunk uh, of business will uh, be done separately there it means the UK Parliament has lost its historic uh, role. But it's also lost its historic role because of membership of the Euro European Union. Uh, when Harold Macmillan first applied to take Britain into the EEC uh, in 1961, he told Parliament that this was uh, merely a commercial negotiation with no political implications. Uh, of course, he was lying through his teeth. Uh, this was a deliberate deception because the British, he knew, had stronger ties to the Commonwealth, America and elsewhere, uh, saw their record in the Second World War as the apotheosis of British separate uh, institutions and political institutions. And so no mention was made of the real aim of the Treaty of Rome, ever closer union in political and economic affairs. Um, it's very funny, this is still the case today. Proponents of the EU say in order to trade with Europe, you have to be part of it, as if this was straightforward. Uh, if I said to you, in order to trade with China, you had to be part of it, uh, you would immediately see there was something strange or even scary in this. If you want to trade with the United States or Japan, you don't have to be part of it. But to trade with the EU, supposedly you have to be part of it because it has this uh, aim of ever closer union. Edward Heath continued a deception that it was just a commercial and not a political uh, scheme uh, when he took Britain into membership of the EEC in 1973 on very, very bad terms. They were desperate uh, to get in. The, the civil servant who led the negotiations uh, in his memoir said that the policy they pursued was, quote, swallow the lot, swallow it now. The civil servant leading the negotiations that Cameron has promised us is uh, someone who's previously worked for Kenneth Clark, uh, Sully in Britain, uh, and other leading um, Euro fanatics. So we can't expect much from the negotiations. Uh, it was only when Mrs. Thatcher came to power and clashed with Brussels over the rising cost of British membership uh, and plans to establish monetary and political union that the whole issue of the EU uh, became highly controversial. But since the Labour Party, which had traditionally opposed British membership of the EU, found that it could do nothing to resist Thatcherism at home, when the Labour Party was told by Jacques Delors, the president of the commission who came to the TUC conference in 1988 and said, oh, you poor benighted Labour people, don't worry about Thatcherism. You can't stop it, but we can. Brussels will stop it. And so after that, he said there'd be social and economic union. Uh, socialism would come from Brussels. And therefore, the Labour Party and the trade unions stood on their heads and decided to bank Brussels. This led to Mrs. Thatcher's Bruce speech uh, and polarised the parties over the issue of Europe. Uh, since then, of course, there have been a large number of uh, treaties, Nice, Amsterdam. There was a constitutional treaty in 2005 which failed in the French and Dutch referendums. That didn't matter. 
uh, Angela Merkel said, um, I mean, I knew it was going to happen. I had coffee with her here at LSE for an hour discussing it. And she said, no, you mustn't have referendums or any democratic votes on Europe. That was our main thing. I thought, yes, uh, I have a good overview. But uh, she made it clear when the constitutional f treaty failed uh, democratically, they would alter the wording by 2%. And they would pass it, ram it through European Parliament as the Lisbon Treaty. The only country that resisted was Ireland, which had resisted Maastricht. Uh, but in all these referendums for small countries, if you vote once and vote no, well, you have to vote again until you get it, you get the correct vote. And so Ireland had to have a second referendum until it went uh, yes. Uh, Brown accepted uh, the outcome of the Lisbon Treaty. Cameron said he would demand a vote in Britain, but then he didn't. Uh, another Cameron <laughs> mis uh, deception. Uh, and anyway, so the Lisbon Treaty went through, which made the EU more or less a state uh, and made Britain a province of it, but does allow under one article, uh, allow Britain to uh, sue to secede. Uh, just now, uh, the fact that uh, we're in the EU means, according to Steve Hilton, uh, who was David Cameron's blue-thinking uh, chief advisor until he quit, he went for a sabbatical at Stanford University, and at a discussion at Stanford, he was the Prime Minister's right-hand advisor, he said in Britain today, he said 40%, 40% of all British government time is taking up, taken up with EU regulation, 30% is taken up by British legislation and 30% is taken up by crisis management or panic reactions to the headlines of the day before. So that's how British government, according to the chief advisor to David Cameron, works. According to the Interior Ministry in Germany, 80% of all domestic legislation in Europe originates in Brussels. According to the Liberal, Liberal Democrats, 75% of all legislation in Britain originates in Brussels. Uh, according to the Tony Blair's cabinet website, the use of a thing called the Regulatory Impact Assessment page, it said that 55% of all red tape uh, that affected British business uh, would, uh, and then that now comes from Brussels. As far as we know, the government won't make any proper cost-benefit analysis, but independent ones say that probably about 4% of GDP a year uh, is spent on Brussels in one way or another. And if you take opportunity costs, you know, the costs that we, where the things that we might do if we went in, uh, that maybe goes up to 10% a year. In any case, uh, British parliamentary government, one way or another, is now something of a farce. How do I conclude? Uh, I'd like to say that all these things continued, but under the coalition government since 2010, uh, which I regard as one of the worst in British history, we have had this almighty attack on the poorest uh, and most vulnerable sections of the British population, especially the disabled. Uh, we've had people uh, who are trying to get jobs treated uh, like enemies, they have to sort of get to the job centre, uh, sign 80 applications a week, they turn up 10 minutes late, they're sanctioned, i.e. they don't get any benefits at all uh, for the next four weeks. They're supposed to be living like kings. If you're, 50, if you're 18 to 25, your job seeker allowance is about £50 a week. If you're above that, you get £72. Um, we've got 6% unemployment, uh, which is no great thing historically. But if you add the semi-unemployed, the, uh, the, the so-called self-employed who are uh, desperate to uh, do anything as freelancers, roughly about 13% of the population uh, is having a very, very bad time of it. And what is the government's reaction? The latest thing is George Osborne saying that in the next parliament he wants another uh, £38 billion pounds of cuts. And the first £3 billion, he said, would come from the working poor. Well, thank you, George. Uh, and the result of this lack of social cohesion, because meanwhile the top 1% is having a wonderful time with bankers' bonuses and uh, the, the executive pay of CEOs is going up by uh, leaps and bounds, 
this great inequality, this growing inequality we're seeing, which may be due to globalization or technological factors as well as just political ones, because the poor and the vulnerable uh, are being forced to um, pay the price of the economic crisis. Uh, we can no longer, I think, talk about social cohesion in Britain. We can no longer talk about um, Parliament uh, being the protector of British liberties. Uh, that's gone with membership of the EU and devolution. We can no longer talk, uh, really, as Britain as a great power uh, because the coalition government has almost more or less destroyed the armed services. Uh, and we were lucky we could actually send six aging tornado jets uh, to take part in the campaign against ISIS. We're not alone in Europe. Europe has no power influence either. Uh, the Germans say that if they were invaded by the Russians, they could perhaps get seven planes up in the air. Uh, that's the latest report to the German Bundestag. Uh, you can't rely on the French either because they have about three tanks. Uh, anyways, 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 what I want to say is that the, the, the three factors which for a very long time, centuries, and then well into the 20th century, uh, mark Britain now as a distinctive country, culture, state, that is, world power, social and economic cohesion, uh, the protection of liberty and the rule of law through the supremacy of parliament, all of it is now in the last decade or so disappeared. And what's going to happen in the future is very difficult to tell. If, if and it's a, it could well, well happen, if during this winter, if it's a hard winter and there are massive power cuts, because the national grid has spare capacity of about 2% at the most, and all our coal fire power stations will be closed down to make way for wind farms, which are no use if there's no wind, or, or, or solar energy, which is no good in winter when it's black. Uh, so, uh, if this is likely, I think, there are going to be massive power cuts, then, you know, the government, which isn't very popular already, uh, will soon have the rug pulled out from under its feet. The Scottish nationalists will probably destroy Labour. And worst of all, it's entirely probable that there will be a second world economic crisis, given all sorts of economic global statistics, uh, and if that happens before the next election, all bets are off. I don't know what could happen. The party I founded, my Frankenstein monster, UKIP, uh, might actually, under all the idiots who run it these days, uh, might actually get an, a large number of MPs, all of them of low IQ uh, and racist uh, tendencies. So um, I don't know what's going to happen, or a large section of Scotland. Uh, you know, you beat, the, you beat the Scottish nationalists in Scotland, the, the, the ironic re response is they, they send them all to Westminster uh, instead of Labour MPs to create chaos there. Uh, we live in interesting times. Uh, the, traditional, the traditional picture of Britain, as I painted it, I think, is about to disappear. And I haven't got the faintest idea of what's coming next, but then I'm a historian, not a political scientist. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Ben. Do you want to stand up or sit down for the rest? I can stand up. Okay. All right. Well, that was a, a, a panoptic discussion of the development of modern British government and conclusions derived from it. Um, now, um, I've got two... Lyndon, I've got... Lyndon? First. Yeah. So, well, when you start speaking, I'm right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So my question is about, so you identified two sort of periods of consensus, the post-war consensus and then the consensus sort of around Thatcherism. When you say consensus, are you implying that sort of before these reforms actually took place, both parties agreed to them? Or is it no, that, no, no, no. It's more that one party has responded to the success of it being introduced by another Okay, that's fine. And my second point really was, you talked about how, for going back over 100 years, the British parliamentary... Sorry, going back over... The last 100 years, the British parliamentary system's been considered fair. The parliamentary system, the electoral system, etc. Last week we had a lecture by Martin Lachlan, who 
noted that increasingly our constitutions are now questioned. We're now codifying a lot more of our rules. What do you think can account for this? Is it the three factors you spoke about? So what do I think of? So what can explain the lack of faith in government, which in a system well, has historically been considered fair for hundreds of years? Um, well, <laughs> I think lack of success. Uh, I, I, I mean, given the record of the present government, uh, it's obviously not fair what they're doing and therefore people are responding to it. I think uh, there was also the feeling that uh, the economic crisis, there was a consensus even before 2008, remember when David Cameron, God bless him, uh, became leader of the Conservative Party and he and George Osborne uh, began the sort of joint leadership. Uh, Tweedledum and Tweedledee pronounced that they would uh, agree to follow the spending targets of Gordon Brown and share the proceeds of growth, <laughs> share the proceeds of growth uh, between uh, investment and tax cuts and what have you. But they were gung ho that they were going to, you know, Gordon Brown, when he first became Chancellor, said he was going to continue Tory policy. Uh, Osborne and Cameron, when they became leaders of the opposition Tory party, said they were going to follow Labour Party policy. And then came the huge international crisis of 2008 to 9. There wasn't any growth. There was a huge uh, uh, growth in the, uh, the deficit, not in GDP. Uh, and since then, um, <laughs> uh, really, uh, what we've had is continuous crisis, continuous cuts. Uh, continuous unfairness from the coalition. Uh, we're in a stage where, you know, Ian Duncan Smith thinks that the bedroom tax is an act of Christian charity. And, uh, you know, despite the fact that he lives on his wife's landed estate that accrues millions of pounds of public welfare money through the Common Agricultural Fund, all of which you might say was welfare on a scale that the poor couldn't dream of, uh, but he, he's got this idea into his head that poor working people should be deprived of benefits. Um, so ever since the, 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 the crisis, really since the coalition came into office, uh, things have gone wrong. Uh, you can see it with the rise of uh, UKIP. You can see it with the rise uh, of the Scottish National Party. Uh, they're reacting really to conditions created by the coalition. I mean, right up until 2010, although UKIP was getting a few benighted, unknown, anonymous MEPs, half the jail for fraud, the other half taking expenses uh, in, in, in Brussels, but with, with no impact on, on either side of the channel, since nobody knows who MPs do or who they are or care very much. Um, but at home, in Britain, in by-elections and local elections, UKIP was getting nowhere. It was getting the usual one or two percent. And um, it was only when the Liberals, Lib Dems, went into coalition with the Tories that they gave up the, the position of protest party and UKIP became the default uh, protest party. And there's a lot to protest about. I mean, they've got no rational policies or anything. It's just um, prejudices against immigrants mainly that keep them going. But they're getting a protest vote from people uh, who in a situation created by the economic crisis and the policies of coalition have chosen to deal with it. I mean, they, they, they could have taxed the bankers, they could have taxed landowners, they could have taxed the city, but they didn't. They decided that the, uh, the main cuts were going to be welfare. And, you know, ordinary people had the resentment uh, deflected against the, uh, the welfare claimants, and welfare claimants had their resentment deflected against immigrants. And that's how it's all gone. So the people in this country who've got nothing to lose, who've got no property, who are not really, the, the, you know, who are the least educated, the, the least able to secure jobs in a very insecure job market, they're now in Scotland deserting Labour for the SNP, which we saw spectacularly in the referendum. Uh, and in England, they're deserting Tories and Labour as well, but many Tories for, for UK. No, and can I just, I mean, just to join in on that, I mean, the, the decline, I mean, what you're describing in the matter of the coalition and its pre, the previous government, certainly, is the decline of the dominance, the, uh, 
what others would call hegemony of the two-party state. But actually, of course, that's been going on, uh, as has a fall in turnout, since almost the middle of the earlier consensus. So the, the, the decline in support for the Labour and Conservative parties taken together has been going on not uninterruptedly, but over time is a trend from the 1950s right the way through to now. So, and turnouts have fallen. So, uh, surely you're loading more onto the coalition than just what's going on, or, you know, this government and the previous one. This no, has been going on for some time. No, no. no. Uh, well, I, I take your point, but uh, I mean, a lot of that was kind of apathy and people accepting the system and not bothering. Uh, what you get now is very different. It's a kind of hate, hate, hatred and resentment of the system. And you've never had a part... I mean, I founded it, I started it all, but you, you've, you've never had a party go from really zilch to a position where it can win the European elections and it can overtake uh, the Lib Dems and be an, almost an equal standing and, and, and a higher standing in some parts of the country with the major parties in the space of about five years. You simply haven't had that. You had quite spectacular by-election results and what have you in the early 80s with the, you know, the, the advent of the STP. But in a sense, that was a new party made up of conventional ex-cabinet ministers who were part of the system and it was part of the establishment sort of you know, reconfiguring itself. This is different. Well, it's we not, don't know it's, it's not the... yet, though, do we? We don't know it's different because if, if it, if you take the sort of the great liberal by-election in Orpington in 1962, or uh, the uh, the rise of the Social Democrats in the early 80s when Labour was in such trouble, and UKIP today, we won't know until 10 or 15 years from now whether UKIP was another flash in the pan, and. But one thing we do know is that the Labour plus Conservative vote is in long-term systemic decline. It's been going through all of these things like that. Yeah, yeah, I know. But the, the Lib Dems and SDP, as I see it, were, you know, just part of the same establishment system. UKIP isn't. UKIP is something far nastier and more radical the way it's led just now. And the Scottish Nationalists... Uh, although they had by-election results uh, in the late 60s and what have you, the fact that they could sweep a depart, get the result they got in the referendum, and since then, look as if they could sweep the Labour Party, which has dominated uh, Scottish politics really for most of the century, uh, the fact that it looks as if they could sweep them off the board, I think these are much more... I agree. <laughs> it could be that something will happen and in 10 years' time that I look back and think, oh, I panic. <laughs> mm, maybe I panic, but I've got cause to panic. Uh, I think the system is under threat uh, from forces which are much more hostile to it than the Lib Dems were. Uh, no, no, I, I, can see, I can see they're a very different... Uh, OK, now Sam, <coughs> Sam, 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 Sam. You say? Yeah. Hi, Lee. Um, I just want to build on and get what you just said about the elections. Um, I think quite simply, do you foresee another coalition in 2015, given how um, Scotland, Scotland, in Scotland, Labour is losing and how uh, Tories are in decline and their votes are being cut off um, by the UK? Do you see another coalition? And if so, what would the consequences? Um... Partly it depends on how the Lib Dems do. Uh, the Lib Dems reckon they'll still come out with about 20-odd seats and uh, that, that UKIP will be lucky if they get a handful. I'd be quite happy with that, <laughs> given the, what I know about the, the leadership of UKIP. Uh, but, but... Um, it really depends what happens this winter. It depends on how massive uh, a series of cuts the Lib Dems and uh, the Tories are putting forward. The Lib Dems have got to the stage where, uh, you know, they're, they're desperate. They would prostitute themselves to anybody that would give them a government position. Um, they, they, they know they can't uh, go back to being a party of protest. They've destroyed that forever. Uh, there will not be a 
you know, persuadable party of protest. No, no one, there won't be a real, no, no one will believe them. There won't be a credible uh, party of protest. So they want to have a Who will have them? I don't think the Labour Party will have them, although the Labour Party may be so desperate to get into power that it will have them. Uh, UKIP, with have it's got MPs, will only vote with the Conservatives because they're a far-right party, and the defectors from the Conservatives are very, very right-wing. Um, so, I mean, I, it's, it's difficult to know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, there are some parts of the Lib Dems, of course, who are trying to say we're not really Tories, we're really just as radical as we used to be, and we've saved the country from even worse and more dire cuts and consequences. Uh, they can't make up their minds. So I'm, uh, they can't give you a straight answer. Carl Schmitt, the, the German legal philosopher, who's very right-wing, joined the Nazis, as you probably know, uh, who a Nazi piece of work altogether, but he was quite fun at times as an intellectual. And he, he once said of German liberals that if they were given the choice uh, between Christ and Barabbas, uh, they would set up a committee of inquiry. Uh, so, I mean, some liberals are like that. I, I mean, that's what they do. They can't make up minds about anything. But there are others who definitely want to be in power. I don't know. I mean, I, it's, I think depending on what happens between now and the election, depending on where there are power cuts, where the economy is actually seen to be consolidating or turning back down again, which is probably what it's going to do, given the international economic situation, given the European issue, and the EU is not, as you, can, as you can see, is not making life very easy for Mr Cameron. I wouldn't be at all surprised one of these days David Cameron decided, oh, I've decided I'm taking Britain out of the EU. <laughs> it's the only way I'm going to save the Tory party. Uh, he might do it. I don't know. Uh, anything's possible. The first past that you made, early on in, what you, in your lecture, you made a, a strong point about the first past the post voting system as a way in which it effectively, because it create such a high barrier for other than the first party and the second party within it to overhaul the second party to get in. I mean, ought that not to retain its capacity to, in your terms, save Britain from any of these insurgent parties that worry you so much? Well, it won't save Scotland because, <laughs> you know, the Labour, the Labour Party is becoming the third party. Or, or I mean, there, there, there isn't, the, the two-party system is one in Scotland now where the SNP is a major party. So it's not like a third party trying no, no, to get no. through. But, but so taking it's your own view about what happened in the early 20th century. Yeah, well, the system's changed. That all depended on two major parties, which were obviously the major parties and, you know, consolidated and in control. We've now got a situation where, in Scotland, the, the, the major party is the SNP, and by May 1915, in England, we don't know who the major party will be. You see, if the, the Tory party could cohere, but the Tory party is panicking, and if the Labour Party could cohere, but the Labour Party doesn't like its leader and it's a meltdown as well, it, you know, it's not the same situation, I think, suddenly. I don't think it's two major parties fending off a small third one. It's not the situation in Scotland, and I'm not sure it will be in England. And described like that, it begins to sound like the factional politics that predated the creation of modern politics, of the modern major bloc political parties in the 19th century, if you put it like that. Yeah, except much more that fragmented we have, except we have real system. elections. Sorry? Except we have real elections. We have real elections. Anyway, any other GB311? Well, just. Okay, yes, come here. Uh, thank you. Uh, I disagree with your other thing saying regarding nationalisations. Those organisations were worthless. Those organisations now are for electric and gas are worth billions. And uh, their profit, which they take from this country, is gross. Uh, nationalisation was not for profit, no, obviously was for that agenda. It was to give the people of the country that have no power, uh, power at a stake and uh, part of the process of democracy, which it gives the poor and vulnerable uh, uh, a, a real visible and understanding that they are part of the whole country. I think to uh, dismiss nationalisation the way you have them, is a great disservice to the vulnerable, but claiming to uh, 
Okay, let's just take that question first. I mean, was national nationalisation was done for? I mean, some of the industries, it's true, were at the time in a very poor way. Some of which was to do with the war. Much of it was not. But the truth is that let's take the railways, which is a relatively easy one. The railways were nationalised partly because it was known the rail the country needed a railway and. Well, it was believed the country needed a railway. I think there had been a consensus about that. And the question was how to preserve it. And indeed, the preservation of it means that today Britain does have an effective and successful railway. Had it been left in the private sector, it would surely all have gone bankrupt and we'd have been left with virtually no railway. Just let's take that point first. Um, well, when Labour came into power, I said it was going to... Labor is in a very, 1945. Yeah, Labour is a very curious record on nationalisation. In the mid-1930s, uh, its policy programme was to nationalise practically anything that moved, including Granny and the Budgie. Uh, by the time it got through the Second World War and came into office, when Labour came in and it went to look at the party uh, archives to see what it had on nationalisation, what it was going to do, it discovered... Well, uh, there was a policy statement, one page, drawn up by Jim Griffiths and written in Welsh, uh, which didn't help it very much. Uh, so what they did was to take the kind of uh, board model which had been used for the BBC uh, and uh, some other uh, public bodies in the, in the 20s. And so really all that happened was that the people that owned these industries uh, were compensated with large sums of money, which they invested in profit-making ones, as I said. And the state took over the other ones, uh, gave them nominal control under a board, which got a few trade union leaders uh, uh, stuck on it, as well as other worthies who had no, never intervened, never did anything. Uh, and management uh, remained the same. It made no, wait a minute, it made no difference. Whatever the, the theory was, ideologically, that by owning something, or by the state owning it, the workers had a share in it, it was bullshit. Basi wait a minute, wait a minute. Basically what happened was that the workers remained in the same jobs, under the same managers, the same conditions of work, so that there was no public support for further nationalisation. Uh, after, 19, after the first round of uh, nationalisation, in order for Labour to prove that it was still a radical socialist left-wing party, occasionally thereafter they would put something on the party uh, manifesto to say we'll nationalise X, Y or, or Z, but it, it had really given up any faith in nationalisation as a policy that changed anything very much in the economy, society or the country. Now, uh, you may have great faith that nationalisation uh, is wonderful, but it, uh, traditionally the British people gave up on it. I'm not saying that some bits didn't work. Uh, I mean, National Health Service, which wasn't actually nationalisation since all doctors who work for the National Health Service have individual private contracts, as you know. Uh, and it's really a, a system of individual small enterprises working within a bureaucratic umbrella. Uh, I, you know, given the way the franchises work in the railways today, I'd be quite happy to renationalise them. I really don't see why state uh, companies in Holland and Germany should have control of British franchises when, you know, we could do it ourselves. And the North East Line under direct public control did very well. Uh, I don't want to make a blanket statement about nationalisation. All I am saying is that what happened under Labour after the Second World War was soon seen by the vast majority of voters uh, to have not contributed to social change. Come back once, just History once. Those people you're talking about do not agree with that. The majority of people did regard the nationalisation as the, they could stay safe. Not, not by 1951 they didn't. You could look at opinion polls. OK. Another question, the next to you, oh, there's one here. So you come over here first and then, next, then we'll come over back to you, yeah. Hi, um, I just want to say thank you very much. It was a fascinating talk, but it was, if you don't mind, a slightly depressing one. <laughs> um, I mean, you mentioned all the major parties despairing then. And so my question is, where's your hope 
Who do you like in Parliament at the moment? <laughs> yes. I am starting a new one myself. It's the only thing I can do. If any of you want to start new or new, try it. But um, honestly, I heard the wigs being recreated on the radio <laughs> the this morning. No, I mean, I don't know. If you look around, do you see any wonderful uh, future uh, leaders with programs and ideas that are going to rescue us from our present mess? I mean, the, the present government came in and said, A, it would get rid of the deficit, uh, which has been running at 100 billion a year ever since it came in. The national debt goes up and up and up and up towards one and a half trillion. Um, George uh, Osborne has borrowed more money in five years than Gordon Brown borrowed in ten. Uh, you know, any, they said they were going to bring immigration down to under 100,000. It's now a quarter of a million. No target that this government has actually said it would keep is actually being kept. Uh, it's prosecuted a war on the poor, the disabled, the vulnerable. The rich have got richer, the poor have got very much poorer. And, you know, why should I not be in despair? But wasn't some of this, I mean, some of the difficulties that the government has had surely derive from the need for, and you can blame whoever, I'm not saying, you know, how it happened, but the 2008 uh, banking crisis and the global recession, which was particularly bad in Britain for obvious reasons, left the problem for the end of the last government and the whole of this one trying to sort that out with as minimal, an, you know, as minimal an impact on as many people as possible. And in that sense, you could argue, actually, that what the political system as a whole has done is surprisingly good, given what a disaster that was. You know, we were that far away from bank machines being switched off in 2008 and everybody losing their savings. So in that sense, given what a hit it was to the political and economic system, you could argue that they managed their way through it rather well. Well, you could. Uh, I wouldn't. Um, well, I can see you wouldn't. I'm making the point as, a, as an argument. No, no. I mean, obviously, obviously, the economic crisis had to be faced, and it was. Obama and Brown together uh, staved off a, a worldwide depression. But since then, uh, you know, the Conservatives came, the coalition came in with its promise to get rid of the deficit in one parliament, we're now in two parliaments, probably three, four, five parliaments. Uh, but the, it's the way you choose to do it. It's how you, you know, if there have to be cuts or there have to be tax increases, uh, they won't increase taxes. Uh, the cuts are all to the poor and vulnerable. Uh, and, you know, the, the, it could have been done in a different way. You say people aren't affected. Uh, go out there in the country and look at the food banks and... Uh, look at the people in the streets and look, look at the people who have been sanctioned and look at uh, people in care homes and all other sorts of places and you'll find that you know, millions have been very badly affected. I'll put the question back to you. I mean, you are obviously, I detect from the tone of your question, slightly more optimistic than the tone of the lecture. What If, so, if I'm right, what, does, what makes you slightly more optimistic than the tone of the lecture? Um, I think, well, I'm not, I'm not a political theorist. I'm, I, I mean, I'm an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. um, and so, sort of, from a great historic, you know, great history, there seems to be, there's always pessimism. Yeah. But the trend, people on the whole uh, have more free time, they have more money, they're living, in, in terms of a great history, like, I'm talking about a millennia here, rather than, 50 years. And so I, I think... Well, I agree we're better off than cavemen, because <laughs> they're doing that. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I just think there must, there must always be a uh, sort of optimism. Yeah. 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 Yeah in the 18th and 19th century about British politics, they were pretty pessimistic then, or read uh, you know, the great political writers of the time. I don't think pessimism is new, nor indeed new to, not, not unique to Britain. Um, but, I, but, but question, do you think it's worse now, this degree of pessimism? I mean, is Russell Brand, I don't want to get you going on Russell Brand, by the way, but does Russell Brand 
um, who is now taken as a kind of an icon of um, political thought. Not by me. <laughs> is, but his, his appearance in the political constellation is itself an interesting um, it's a very, it's his... very worrying, isn't it? Uh, if you have to take <laughs> Russell Brand as a political prophet, but the um, no, I mean, I, I, uh, the great sweep of history. Well, <laughs> uh, there are periods in history where things get worse rather than better. I, I don't know if other anthropologists believe in this, but believe me, it's true. Uh, if you're alive, Talleyrand once said that nobody who hadn't experienced the Ancien Régime in France knew how sweet life could really be. Unfortunately, it was followed by the French Revolution uh, and civil war in Europe for the next 25 years. Uh, no doubt Imperial Russia was very wonderful for all sorts of sections of society, but then came Lenin and Stalin. There might even have been people that enjoyed the Weimar Republic, but it was followed by Hitler. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> you know, Britain so far has not had any experiences like that. But Britain, uh, you know, looks to me as if it might go back to the um, 16th century when Scotland was independent uh, and we were part of a kind of European hegemony by Habsburgs and others and they didn't have control of our own affairs. I don't particularly want to go back to the 16th century, thanks very much. It wasn't really a very nice time for most people. Uh, but, you know, it may be, miracles may happen, you know. Uh, it may be that the economic crisis will disappear, the deficit will disappear, taxes will be cut, money will be showered on the poor, food banks will disappear, uh, and, uh, you know, UKIP's prejudices against foreigners and immigrants will be irrelevant, may happen. But I don't see any reason to suspect that it's going to. And you know, even the optimism of, of an anthropologist, um, you know, I don't see what it's based on. I mean, if you could tell me that there are obvious signs in all the sort of contemporary mix, Russell Brand as our new Führer or leader or prophet, I don't know what it is. I just don't see the signs that were... I mean, I'm not against optimism. I'd love to be optimistic. Uh, but, you know, give me the evidence, show me the signs, show me the reason why I should be optimistic. Okay, we've got optimism coming up in weeks to come. There's one further question. We must be short and sharp here, yes. Thank you. Um, what, what do you think is the cultural mentality which makes British give up their confidence so quickly after the war? Oh, um... Why did the British just easily give up and get Well, partly it had always been part of the plan, you see. We had given up the major colonies, the ones that, you know, meant something to British people, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. South Africa got independence in, what, 1912. Uh, Rhodesia got de facto independence in 1923. The bits that were left <laughs> were odd bits of Africa that nobody was really interested in, had no economic significance whatsoever, and a few bits of Asia. So if they wanted independence, fine, give it to them. Uh, we'll give you some aid, you can have it. We'll send a royal, we'll put a flag up, you can have independence. As far as Britain was concerned, if you looked at opinion polls, most British people didn't know that the empire existed in these places, didn't care that it existed. Uh, you know, no reason to regret its demise. I mean, so Sierra Leone gets independence. What does that mean to the average Brit? Most people couldn't find France on a map, far less Sierra Leone. So, I mean, it doesn't really mean very much. Uh, there's no economic interest to retain. Uh, the, 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 most of these countries are of very little significance in terms of power, money, wealth. It's just that they were taken when some colonial adventurer <laughs> you know, stuck a flag in a pole and said, I, mean, I take this territory in the name of Her Majesty the Queen. It took about six months before the news reached London. They, oh my God, we've got another colony. Uh, they, they turned down Nigeria three times and they still got it. They didn't want it. Some man, I don't know if you know, Sindh, uh, the province in northwest uh, India, uh, Sindh, S I N D, the man who captured Sindh sent a telegram to the war office that said, Pekavit. <laughs> 
which is Latin for I have sinned. And it was sort of a funny joke, but per capita meant I have sinned. He'd actually taken the whole province of sin, which was bigger than the whole of Britain. So, I mean, this kind of thing happened. But, I mean, you know, it was all... You know, you're these little proconsuls that kept adding a little extra bit of territory. Um, uh, you know, some of them wanted to have the whole of Africa, you know, from Cape Town to Cairo, and it didn't work out. But, I mean, for most British people, hmm, it was all irrelevant. Which British... I mean, I'm trying to remember who said a faraway place of which we know little. Who, who was that? That was Neville Chamberlain about Czechoslovakia in yes. 1930. I mean, that, that, and it kind of gives you a sense of how it is possible to stand in Britain, is it not, and sort of think about the rest of the world, in any country, and think of the rest of the world. No, if you want to have a bit of a shock, go around uh, the streets of uh, London, uh, housing estates or wherever, have a map of Europe, and ask people to tell you, to point out just which countries, uh, uh, you know, which. They're, they're the one. It's very difficult even to argue about the European Union. <laughs> Most people have no idea about its institutions. They've got a vague idea it's across the channel. Can't really tell the difference between one part of it and the next. Uh, don't know much about the institutional structure. And, um, yeah. And that, doesn't, that, that includes Tory candidates, of course. OK, we'd better stop there because there will be people waiting to go for the next lecture. I'd like to thank Alan Sked uh, very much for talking about the development of the modern British government. Next week we will hear about Parliament and government, the institutions of Parliament and government from Professor George Jones. See you then. Thank you.